Hello, everyone, uh, and thanks for joining uh, Matrix IFS and Cybrella Readiness Webinar on New York DFS Cybersecurity Regulation. My name is Idan, and I'll be your moderator for today. Today's webinar will focus on uh, New York DFS 500 regulation. Who does it affect? What are the requirements and recommendations on how to best achieve compliance? Uh, our speakers for today will be uh, Daniel Krill from uh, Matrix IFS. He is the Managing Director uh, and heads regulatory and operational risk in the advisory practice and brings 15 years of industry experience in financial crime, surveillance and regulatory compliance. We also have from Cybrella, Avi Legman, who is the Managing Director um, and Head of Cybersecurity Practice. Uh, Avi has over 25 years of operating experience in the IT and cybersecurity sectors. Uh, a couple of sentences on each of the companies you're going to be hearing from. Uh, Matrix IFS is a specialized financial crime IT service provider who has been providing services for financial institutions around the world since 2006 with over 500 projects completed, ranging from advisory to implementation of various solutions and technologies. Cybrella is an advanced cybersecurity solution provider delivering cyber resilience services to customers in the US and beyond uh, from uh, risk and vulnerability services. So before further ado, I'm going to pass the baton to uh, Daniel, who's going to kick off the webinar. Thank you, Idan. So as mentioned, Matrix IFS and Cyberella have partnered to provide complementary advisory and implementation services across financial crime, regulatory compliance, and cybersecurity. As the industry shifts towards enterprise data and shared services, holistic approaches to risk management seek to bridge the gap between these siloed functions. Firms are realizing that monitoring, testing, surveillance, discovery, and investigation processes must be shared across their financial crime and cybersecurity compliance programs in order to efficiently meet regulatory expectations. NYDFS 500 is a set of regulations that span across compliance and financial crime risk, but through the lens of cybersecurity risk. So it's important to view this regulation in the context of a firm's overall compliance risk management, cybersecurity, and IT control frameworks. Next slide, please. So more about NYDFS 500. First and foremost, the New York Department of Financial Services is the department of the New York State government responsible for regulating financial services and products. In its capacity, the NYDFS closely monitors cybersecurity threats posed to the financial system. Given the increase and potential severity of these threats, the NYDFS has set forth a regulatory minimum standard for cybersecurity, which requires companies to conduct a risk assessment and then implement a program with security controls for detecting and responding to cyber events. This is Title 23 of the NYCRR, the New York Codes, Rules, and Regulations, Part 500, named Cybersecurity Requirements for Financial Services Companies. The enforcement of this regulation is supervised by the NYDFS superintendent, and entities could be penalized from $2,500 US dollars per day up to $75,000 per day in the event of a knowing and willful violation. Next slide, please. The NYDFS is part of a complex regulatory and cybersecurity environment for the financial services sector. There are multiple US federal and state regulators that have issued rules and guidance regarding cybersecurity requirements. To name a few, FINRA has issued cybersecurity guidance and rules around supervision and supervisory control systems. The SEC has rules around identity theft, privacy of consumer financial information, and safeguard personal, safeguarding personal information, to name a few. More detailed is the Information Technology Examination Handbook published by the FFIEC. The Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council is actually comprised of five banking regulators, including the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Beyond those, there's the Graham Bleach Bliley Act, which was passed into law in 1999. This is an incredibly large piece of legislation 
that includes requirements that financial firms have technical and physical safeguards to protect customer records and information. And also Sarbanes-Oxley that calls for internal controls and testing. This is just an illustrative list, but understanding how NYDFS 500 falls within the broader regulatory landscape that your firm is subject to is important when updating your control framework. Our focus here is on NYDFS and other US regulatory bodies, but this also applies when you look at other jurisdictions that you may operate globally, such as the UK with the Bank of England CBEST, Germany with Baffin and MaRisk, IT strategy expectation and CISO responsibilities, and Singapore and Hong Kong have all issued circulars on cyber hygiene, technology risk management, and, and other requirements related to cybersecurity. As you can see, this is an illustrative example that there is an, a lot of overlap of the controls required in the NYDFS regulations and those specified in the Graham Leach Bliley Act and the FFIEC guidelines. Other than this regulatory, but there are also several industry standards, namely NIST cybersecurity framework which has become the gold standard of cybersecurity in the US and for many other global entities. And also ISO 27001, which is the prevalent global information security standard. NYDFS aligns with components from both, such as identifications of cybersecurity threats, employing defense infrastructure, detecting and responding to cybersecurity events, and fulfilling regulatory reporting requirements in par with NIST. NYDFS also requires developing cybersecurity policy and procedures in alignment with ISO 27001 standards. The bottom line is that while many financial organizations are already required to meet guidelines outlined in the FFIEC, SOX, and the GLBA, the New York cybersecurity regulation is more prescriptive in nature. Institutions are now required to implement specific policies, procedures, and technologies to comply with the regulation. I'll turn it over now to my colleague Avi Legman to dive into the details of NYDFS 500. I'm going to start covering the actual details of this specific regulation. And I'll start with the who, when, and the what. Starting with the who, who is really under this regulation? So if we look into what entities are covered under this New York DFS 500, what we can see is any financial institution that has a, an ongoing practice within the New York State are actually part of the entities that needs to be complied. That includes trust companies, credit union, banks, mortgage brokers, insurance companies, as well as branches and agencies of companies that are actually not a U.S. bank originally, but they have presence and doing business in the New York area. So that basically covers who needs to be applying and complying with this new regulation. There is a, an exclusion to this regulation that actually includes the following criteria. If the, if the entity has less than 10 employees, if it basically has less than $5 million in gross revenue per fiscal year, or it has less than $10 million in asset by the end of the year, they're actually excluded and they are not really required to comply to this new regulation that has been placed into all the, the financial institutions uh, in New York area. Next slide. So when, this is an important question. This is nothing new that actually started today, but definitely because we are under this heavy attack by the coronavirus, the regulation actually and the requirement this year are actually much, much more harsh just because most of these institutions are working from home and of course the threat level and the threat map actually have changed and actually become more prevalent. So it actually requires even more uh, of the cybersecurity framework to be implemented. But originally this regulation started in the late 2017, and then basically was ended on the fourth phase in the mid 2019. But we have to remember that this is a yearly compliance requirement. So 
the first step was actually to, to create an initial certification of compliance. This is how it started the program in the first phase. Then it created on the second phase in the later 2018, a baseline, the reports, what assessment, what kind of capabilities and activities an organization needs to take to basically confirm with a cybersecurity framework that it's required to protect itself. Towards the end of 2018, the regulators added basically phase number three, which is advanced capability in place. We are going to talk about the details of those advanced capabilities. And then the final phase of this regulation that happened in mid-2019 basically made the following statement. Assuming that we actually created the framework and we actually created a cybersecurity controls around the entity itself, most of the entities today are actually very active on working with third party service providers. We know of many entities that have tens and tens of service providers that are accessing their sensitive data on a daily basis to provide them some sort of a service. The regulator came at the final stage and said, here is the procedures and the policies, how to engage with the third party to make sure that they are actually safe as well and they are not creating additional vulnerability to your organization when they touch your data. So with that, that's sort of like the fourth phase, sort of like done in the mid of 2019. And as we stated, this is a yearly regulation that needs to be compliant. Next. So what, the, let's talk about the what. The what basically talks about back again into the phases. The first phase was the practice and the NFS 500 took different kind of regulations that Daniel were talking about it and created what it's called the best practice. And it's within the framework of the cybersecurity. So it created the program for the cybersecurity. It created the policies and procedures that every organization needs to go through created basically a requirement from a chief information security officer that develops the program, manage it and report it as well. So that's under his privilege and under its responsibility. It defines the access privileges. So who can access and what kind of data they can access. What happens if an event happens or if it becomes an incident? What are the reactions and the plan inside the organization to react to such an event? How do we train the people within the organization there's a basic training about what to avoid and how to basically have a cyber hygiene. But more than that, how to train a specific group within the organization that will be carrying through and managing this cybersecurity framework on a daily basis. And then finally, on the phase one was actually the notification. What do you do if an event happens and how quickly you can actually requires to be notified into the superintendent? The second phase basically is more of like the technology and testing. This is adding and augmenting on the best practice as a program and policies. What do you report? How do you report? When do you report? Risk assessment of an organization is a critical part of any cybersecurity framework, but specifically for New York DFS as well. And what that basically entails is that every organization needs to assess and reassess on a periodic basis, the risk profile. And you do it through pen testing, which is hacking from the outside into the network like a hacker. So trying to find a pinhole into the organization through vulnerabilities, doing port scanning, looking for known and unknown vulnerabilities the organization have, make sure that those are patched and make sure that we know the risk profile up to date on an ongoing basis. There are some other things that the technology and the testing actually added, which is multi-factor authentication, which means if you are an employee or somebody that has access to the system and you are trying to access the system for external, how do you basically be authenticated, identified to make sure that you get the right grants to get into the system? On the phase three, it's more of like the operation excellence. This is where how much of an audit do you need in trails three to five years? What are the, 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 the plans for application security? Many of the enterprises 
within the financial sector has either developed their own application or they're using a third party application, it's very crucial to test them and retest them just to make sure that there are no any known vulnerability on them. How long do you need to retain the data? What do you do with monitoring and how do you encrypt sensitive data? Then the last one, as we said, there's a third party service provider component. What are those policies in place that every entity that actually engage with third party needs to be making sure that they are compliant as well as part of the program. And then on an ongoing basis to maintain this program and make sure that the framework in place, make sure that the risk is being measured and known and mitigated then there is a steady state actions, which includes basically the chief information security officer being active, having a monitoring in place, doing a periodic assessment, make sure that the third parties are complying with our risk factors, do the annual reporting to get the certification, as well as update and enhance the program as an ongoing basis. Next. So, Let's go into a little bit more details on phase one. This is the policy design. So in the beginning of 2018, phase one was, okay, so we are actually going to provide a policy that actually needs to address all the concern and the best practice based on ISO 2701, which is the one that actually Daniel mentioned before as well. What's notable that the policy has to cover how do you deal with the information security? How do you deal with the access control, which basically means who is controlling, who is entering the system and what they can touch? What do you do for disaster recovery? Uh, what happens if the systems are down? How do you access them? How do you recover from a disaster recovery? Having a high availability plan. What do you do to basically maintain the network and the system security in on, on times 24-7? The customer data privacy is an important thing, though we are not following in the US yet on the GDPR, but the data privacy of the customers is one of the most essential things that we need to protect. And of course, as we said, the regular risk assessment, we need to test and retest on a periodic basis. What is our risk profile? What vulnerabilities we have and have been created? The last point on the policy design, there is a must as part of this regulation to notify on any event and incident the, the superintendent within the 72 hours from the inspection of that uh, event. Next. We got into the second phase and this is more of like the reporting procedure. It is required to have a CISO on staff or actually as a virtual CISO as well that actually going to be responsible and carry through the annual reporting. It has to be basically provided to the board and to the senior management of the company, as well as it has to be provided to the superintendent of the New York DFS 500 to get actually the certify for the regulation. It will include all the cybersecurity policies and procedures, the security risk that has been found. And, and let me just basically mention a couple of things. When you do a risk assessment, and you're doing it on a periodic basis, you might find some new vulnerabilities that haven't been found before. So one of the things that has to be included within the annual report is the actual facts about the risk that we found in the company. If it's been patched and it's basically been fixed, it's great. If it's not, it has to be indicated what are those vulnerabilities and what is the plan to actually mitigate them as soon as possible. So, the final thing in this report is basically the CISO has to sort of like state what is the effectiveness of the organization to basically make sure that the controls on the cybersecurity measures are actually in, in, in place and they are in the best practice mode. Next. The phase three is basically uh, more on the program development itself. It's adding on top of the policy and the reporting. It requires a comprehensive security, cybersecurity program in place. It basically has to have the audit in place. And again, there has to be a written documentation within the company, just like any other regulation, to get a compliance. You need to have the procedures, the standards, and the guideline for the in-house application in place and written. It has to have how do you evaluate the third-party application. And it has to have a policy on the data retention, 
as well as what do you do with the non-public, which is the sensitive information that basically is within the organization. Once you basically have all this written down as a policy, this is where basically you have a program being developed and it's ready to basically be performed and, and actually delivered as a compliance at the end of every one of the years. Next. The final stage, third party security. From our experience, many of the financial institutions have a lot of partners that are touching the data on a daily basis. We need to make sure that they confirm with our business practice. We need to make sure that their cybersecurity policy is at par or even better, so they are not providing actually an additional threat into our own cybersecurity framework. So what we need to do is make sure that there is a written policy how do we assess a third party security? And it has to have what kind of risk assessments and third party service providers are basically being done. We need to make sure that they are aware about all the different must and must do when they conduct business and touching our systems. They have to have an evaluation of how effective is their third party security practice. Usually it's been done by a questionnaire. And as I said, Everything on this assessment has to be done on a periodic basis, which basically means when they actually touching your system, they have to pass the third party security details and procedures. But then on a periodic basis, they need to be tested and retested just to make sure that we are still safe doing business together. Thanks. So when we actually going into the details of this regulation, there is multiple sections that combines together into the program framework policies and procedures. And as anything else that we basically have been examined, there's the elements of the people, the process and the technology that you're using to fulfill that program. So if we look into the next step, we have the most important part of uh, this, this regulation. This is a chief information security officer. There are a couple of comments that needs to be made when we are talking about this function. This function is the most critical one to be able to comply with this regulation. This function within the organization could be aligned and been assigned by a person that has an experience and knowledge about cybersecurity uh, framework, but it actually could be outsourced to a third party where we actually can come in and provide what we call the virtual CISO function to organizations as well. We found out from our experience that many of the small, medium-sized businesses cannot afford to have a full staff for chief information security officers. And the best practice actually is to bring companies like ourselves to come in and help. What the chief information officer needs to basically make sure that he's developing, is developing the programs and others, but it needs to be actually tied into the specific business requirements of the entity in place. What that basically means is that while there's a framework and there are policies under the NFS 500, the FSF 500, the chief security officer needs to basically adjust it into the actual business that actually he's working with. So it has to be modified, it has to be adapted into the business of the entity. But what it does in the beginning is actually creating the program, creating the policies in place, and all the different activities that requires at start to create what we call the base. And that includes the access privilege, how much of the data needs to be retained, what is the audit trail. So all these basic components that you can see on, on, on the screen right now are part of the initial program that a CISO needs to provide to the organization. Next. Now we, look, we go into the technology. So while you're creating the policies and the programs, you need to start adding some basic technology into the organization to be able to protect the organization from harm. One of the things we talked about it before is MFA, multi-factor authentication. There has to be a way to identify and authenticate people that are actually trying to connect into the network from external places. If you're inside the organization, 
you are actually being connected inside. But when you are external and you're working from home, and this is something very, very severe these days when most of the people are working from home, you have to have a way to authenticate and identify the person that is trying to get access to the system. Multi-factor authentication is a technology in place that has to be in place to identify and authenticate a user. There are different kinds of technologies within the MFA, some facials, fingerprint, and many other ways, but it has to basically have the function of the MFA to say that Avi is actually connecting into the system right now, but we are sure that this is Avi. This is not only authenticating his laptop or his phone, but actually authenticating the person itself. The encryption side is very important as well because there's a lot of non-public data that the organization are handling, what is called the sensitive data. And if it's basically within the organization or outside, it needs to be encrypted. So it's really, really difficult for anybody that has access to that information to actually take it away. Next. The next step basically is to create this framework and policies, what you need to have is a team of people that are on an ongoing basis maintaining all these procedures, all these policies, doing the risk assessment and others. And so once you have aligned the chief information security officer as the lead, there has to be a specific set of people, a team, that are actually going to execute what is in the framework and it's in the program. Um, some organization have some IT people inside that can be trained. Some other organization, just like the virtual CISO is something that we can provide, we can actually provide a set of people that help execute the program on an ongoing basis. We need to have them trained. We need to basically make sure that we are monitoring on a daily basis for any specific event or anything which is, looks uh, suspicious to make sure that we are on top of things as soon as they happen. Next. So now we go into a little bit more details. We have the framework, we have access privilege, we basically make sure that people from external can get in using multi-factor authentication. We encrypt all the sensitive data and we have a small team that actually either outsource or internally that are going to execute the program and make sure that everything has been uh, up to date. Then we need to basically start testing ourselves. And the test that we need to do is there is a generic risk assessment that actually looks into the organization from different perspective and make sure that they are actually at par with the risk that an organization like this needs to basically be at. Again, best practice. We do penetration testing. Uh, we basically are trying to penetrate into the organization from outside. We are simulating a hacker looking for accesses and, and, and vulnerabilities within the network. Then we are doing port scanning to see known vulnerabilities and make sure that we patch them and fix them. And then we look into the application the organization is using. There are two kinds of application that needs to be considered here. One, there is the internal application, which is application that has been developed by the organization. And there's external application, which is application that has been bought from a third party. Both of them might have vulnerabilities that we're not aware of. Application security testing is a must. We need to make sure that we actually check them in details, look into application testing, code review, and make sure that there is no any known or unknown vulnerabilities within those applications because those could be the places where a hacker actually can come in through. So risk assessment, penetration testing, port scanning, and application testing is a practice that needs to be done periodically and needs to make sure that we actually fix all the problems that we found on an ongoing basis. Next. Incident response. So we know that the regulator basically is requiring us to notify the superintendent as soon as 72 hours that an incident happened. What we need to remember that there is events and there are incidents. An event basically is something that looks suspicious, but it's not necessarily an incident. Once we investigate the event and it becomes an incident, we have to have a process in place, what to do with the incident, what's the action plan? How do we mitigate that incident? How do we make sure that nothing has been taken out and we actually stop the attack as soon as it happened? And again, 
you have to basically report any incident into the superintendent within the 72 hours that it happened. Next. Third party information security. We talked about that. You add that section, which is 511, into the process. And as soon as you protected yourself from within the inside, this is where you're saying to yourself, okay, so I need to protect the partners that actually are my partners, but they're touching my system. So there's the processing in place and the procedures in place to test and retest them so they comply with our cybersecurity framework and we basically do not add any vulnerability just because we are connected with them and doing business on a daily basis. The last section within this regulation is the notice to superintendent. We talked about if there's an incident, we need to notify on the incident within 72 hours. But the real main function of the superintendent is actually to receive a yearly compliance procedure and document that showcase the organization, their completeness, the risk assessment, the vulnerabilities, and all the testing has been done, and all the different frameworks in place to be able to actually receive the compliance on a yearly basis. This is the most important step. We're doing the whole year the work to make sure that the framework in place for eventually get the certification and then go into the next year and basically have it again and again. Any questions? So if there are no any questions, um, what we basically wanted to emphasize is that this partnership between IFS metrics and Cybrella is here to help organization that needs help to basically comply on a yearly basis. We talked about the fact that a CISO can be aligned internally, but if the organization doesn't have it internally, we can actually provide that service. We can actually help organizations within the framework of providing the penetration testing, the risk uh, assessment for each organization on a periodic basis. We can actually work to deliver the, the gap analysis and the assessment of how the company or the entity actually comply with the requirements and the regulation. Develop a detailed risk mitigation and remediation plan uh, we actually can uh, develop the whole cybersecurity compliance program and it can actually be signed off by the CISO. Implement all the missing controls and the missing policies to be able to comply at the end of the year and as well as help the organization file the certification to get that compliance in place. We have to remember this year it has been delayed just because of the coronavirus, but it has to be submitted by June 1st. And we are here to help you all in any possible way uh, to complete this certification on a daily basis. Thank you, Avi. Um, I know that he's, he already asked if there's any questions, uh, in case you're not aware where to ask them. There's a little, little chat button uh, at the bottom of the screen where you can uh, answer questions. And I see a question coming in now. Uh, is my firm already follows uh, NIST, NIST and ISO 27001? How much more of an effort is it to achieve compliance with NYDFS 500? Danielle, do you want to take it or should I take that? I, mean, I, I can go on and, and start these on. So, so if you already have in place um, um, a lot of uh, the requirements recommendations set forth by NIST and, and user 2700 and uh, 2701. It shouldn't be too much of an effort to um, come tick the box and, f and follow through the, the entire NYDFS 500 requirements. Uh, but you do need to, to go through everything and test yourself and, and perform some kind of internal audit or risk assessment in order to make sure that you're already covered and be able to then submit a certificate of compliance. I agree. So I think that most importantly is probably most of the frameworks are in place being ISO 27001 uh, compliant, but in the same place, this regulation requires a yearly certificate. And, and because of that, 
What you need to do is make sure that you are actually taking the framework and writing the compliance to get basically that compliance, but it shouldn't be a huge effort. Great, thank you for that. Uh, there is uh, one more question. One second. Uh, are the New York branches of out-of-state domestic banks required to comply with uh, New York DFS 500? Any, any branch outside of US, inside the US, that has an active branch within the New York state has to comply as well. Any branch. Thank you. And I think we have uh, uh, one final question. Uh, how must a covered entity address cybersecurity issues with respect to its subsidiaries and other affiliates? Not sure that I understand the question, but I'm assuming that the question is, if you have an entity in the New York state and you're working on DFS 500, what is the implication of the subsidiaries outside of the New York state uh, for cybersecurity? The cybersecurity basically is really a, a very full detailed program uh, and branches outside of the New York still acting as part of the company. And because of that, the overall framework has to include them as well. Yeah, and I'll go on and add that uh, there's actually been uh, quite some guidance around how much are covered entities uh, required to address uh, with respect to their cyber to their subsidiaries and other affiliates, and and there is clear guidance on the scope. Even if they are subject to some exemptions, they still would need to to comply with the overall requirements uh, set forth by by the regulations. So, cover entities, subsidiaries, any affiliates, in terms of uh, um, any mergers or acquisitions of other companies that would trigger a requirement to perform another risk assessment and see how non-public information may be stored on other subsidiary or affiliate systems, for example. So, so yes, the coverage is quite uh, extensive in scope. Uh, we have another question that just came in. Uh, do firms generally use a tool like SharePoint, Confluence, etc., to maintain all the supporting documentation to exhibit adherence when requested by NY DFS examiner, or is there a more appropriate tool for governing the overall compilation, review, and uh, attestation of the documents by senior management? Good question. Danielle, do you want to? Yes, yes I'm happy to take uh, that one. Uh, there are quite a few tools available and systems and solutions in place, as well as control frameworks and services um, uh, that, that our firms also provides to uh, establish control, control frameworks and map regulatory requirements to controls, control objectives, and an overall compliance and risk management program. So yes, uh, we can definitely advise on which tools to use and, and it depends on the size and scope of your organization. Some firms uh, can map regulations to controls uh, via uh, SharePoints and Excel tools and that, those kinds of end user computing. But when, when your scope or, or re regulatory landscape is broader, you should probably consider using some kind of rules mapping tool and, right. uh, and control framework. And, and, and by the way, we'll be more than happy to consult if somebody has specific questions related to his organization. Speaking of which, uh, in case uh, you have questions later on uh, or you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can do so by emailing cybersecurity at matrix-ifs.com. Of course, any question for Cybrella, we will uh, forward it to them. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, we hope to see you in our next webinar. Thank you very much.